to um, speak to you today on what I feel the Lord's laid on my heart, and it's interesting, in Sunday school, we uh, looked at this verse, not in depth, but it was read, so we're going to read it again. 1 John 3.1, it's one of the great, great verses describing the fatherhood of God, and what that means to us. 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, way toward the back of your New Testament, 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Let's just stop there a second. We mentioned this in Sunday school, but not all of you are in the class, so I'll mention it again. Behold, that means take notice. This is something I want you to focus on. You know, sometimes in our relationship with God, we get so caught up in life and just dealing with issues and what we're going through, and we, we don't stop and behold what we need to behold. Sometimes it's just good to stop and think about these things. Remember these things in our relationship with the Lord. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. I'm reading the screen because I really, I like that version better than the mine that I have here. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That word bestowed means to lavish. And it's given in the continual sense, meaning He continues to lavish. This is a present reality. This isn't just a gift we got when we got saved. But today, He's continuing to lavish His love upon us in this manner that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. Think about that a minute. You are called a child of God, a son, a daughter of God. You have the privilege this morning of having the God of all creation be your heavenly Father. Think about what a privilege that is. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I say praise God for that. Uh, that excites me. You know, today is, of course, the day that we honor our fathers and those who have played the father rule in our life. And most of us who find ourselves in that type of role, most fathers do their best to fulfill that role as father. But some fathers just put the rest of us to shame. I mean, when you read about what they do, and it just leaves you scratching your head and saying, what manner of love is that they have toward their kids? And let me give you one, uh, what I call super dad. His name is Dick Hoyt. And he has a son, Rick, who during the birthing process uh, sustained severe brain damage. And on top of that, he was also diagnosed with uh, cerebral palsy. And so his son had a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, his, the, the doctor told uh, the father and the mother that, his, of course, their son would never live a quote-unquote normal life. And he even recommended that they just institutionalize him because of his uh, severe disabilities. But Dick Hoyt would not hear of that at all. And he did his best to raise Rick up like any other normal kid, given his disabilities. And although Rick was restricted to a wheelchair, he couldn't speak, he couldn't really use his arms or legs in any kind of normal way, growing up, uh, Dick made sure his son Rick camped, he swam, he attended a regular public school, he even eventually graduated from Boston University. 
And 51 years after that grim diagnosis in which the doctor told him, you need to institutionalize your son, his son Rick not only lives in his own apartment, but he's also a celebrated athlete. And you may wonder, how in the world does someone with that many disabilities be a celebrated athlete? Well, this is how. When Rick was in middle school, another of his classmates had gotten in an accident and become paralyzed. And they were having a fundraiser to raise funds for this child. And Rick wanted to enter a charity race to help raise funds for his classmate. Well, his father, who had never run a race in his life, agreed to push his son, Rick, in a wheelchair during the race. So they got his clunky old wheelchair out, and that's what they did. And it garnered attention. People took notice. And, uh, and Rick and Dick both saw the value of doing that for, for the purpose of raising funds for different things. And so it just took off. That one race led to a lifetime of team racing, and not to mention getting better chairs to do it in. <laughs> Using a specially engineered chair, Dick and Rick have finished more than 1,090 races together, including 252 triathlons, 70 marathons, and 94 half marathons. And you talk about Father of the Year? <laughs> That's amazing. Well, this Father's Day, of course, our minds go to our own Father. And how we as fathers are fulfilling that role in our life. And what I wanted to do this morning was point all of us to the greatest father of them all. I mean, Dick Hoyt, wonderful, wonderful things he's done. Many other fathers sacrificed tremendously. But the greatest father of them all is our father. In heaven. Hallelujah. I mean, every other father sh just pales in comparison to our Father in heaven. And even as I was preparing this message and just thinking in general about the fatherhood of God over us, His children, um, just two thoughts came to my mind that I want to bring out before we get into the specifics. And the first thought is this. Do you know that out of all the different religions in the world, out of all the different belief systems that people have, we as Christians alone have the privilege of calling God our spiritual father. I mean, think about it. The Muslim faith, for example, has 99 names for God. 99 different titles for the God that they serve. None of which is Father. The idea of God being a Father, watching, protecting, providing over them, is alien to their thinking and to their belief system. You could say the same thing about the Buddha's faith. They have no Father in heaven. Of course, New Age belief systems, all the different ways that they come across that don't carry with them the idea of a father in heaven. Hinduism does not. Even though they do have a part of Hinduism that does call God Father, it's simply um, in name only, not in practice or, or not in, in attributes. And even Judaism, where we find our roots. And of course, you read the Old Testament... And there's sections where God does call himself Father. And God presents himself in a fatherly way. But in their practice, in how they actually view God, the idea of God being Father is more metaphoric than actual practice. The, the Jewish mind just cannot comprehend the loving attributes of God as Father. We alone as Christians, in actual practice and experience... Because we come to the Father through Jesus Christ, His Son, are adopted into His family through the blood of His Son, Jesus. We alone, out of all the men and women on the face of the earth, get to call God Almighty our Father. 
What a privilege that is. What a tremendous privilege it is to be able to bow our head and say, Our Father in heaven. That's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. You've heard me talk about how I use the Lord's Prayer as a template for my own prayers normally. And I, I always just pause there and remind myself, thank God He's my Father. I'm in love relationship with Him. And as Father, He provides and does all these things for me. But thank God it's my Father in heaven. He's on the throne in control. He's almighty, all-powerful. And so those two thoughts about God, almighty, all-powerful, all in control, all wise, uh, heaven and earth belong to Him. Uh, the ages belong to Him. Nothing happens beyond His control, beyond His, His ability to bring forth His will. I mean, He's in heaven, but He's also my Father. Those two dynamics, only the Christian faith bring together. And then the other thought about the fatherhood of God, before we get into the specifics, is that I understand, and I think Heather brought it out earlier, many people have trouble really understanding or grasping or, or accepting God as Father in the way that we're describing here. And it's because their earthly fathers have failed to model God properly to them. And may I remind you, fathers and grandfathers, one of our primary roles is to model God to our children. And the thing is, most people, how they view God as Father, reflects how their relationship with their earthly father was. In other words, if their earthly father was strict and unloving, and harsh, and judgmental, and never showed love, never sh expressed anything like that, and they were distant, then they're going to have a really hard time accepting a God's uh, as Father as loving and accepting. And they're going to have a really hard time with that. Or on the other end of the podium there, if you as a father are just so wrapped up in your own world and leaning it and you go oh, whatever they want to do and you never set boundaries, you never discipline, they're going to have a really hard time understanding how God lovingly disciplines. Their concept of God as Father is drawn first and foremost from their relationship with us as fathers. And obviously, none of us as fathers model God perfectly. That, none of us do that. I can look over my own experiences and uh, there would be things I do differently now. There are things you do in the heat of the moment that you would change if you could go back. None of us model God perfectly. But some fathers fail miserably at this. And, but here's what I want you to know. Where your earthly father may have fallen short... Maybe even he was abusive, not just neglected, but abusive in some way. But where your earthly father has fallen short, you have a father in heaven who is perfect. Perfect in all his ways. And if you will just learn, and, and it's a learning process, if you will just learn to rest in His love, lean on His love, stay close to Him, get to know Him, what you will find is that where your earthly father may have failed you in certain areas, your heavenly father never will. And you will be able to begin to experience what true fatherly love is. God is our Father in heaven, our perfect Father. And let me just mention three ways here in the remaining minutes that God is the perfect Father for all of us. And the first way is this. God's love 
is expressed. Isn't that what John is saying here? See what great love the Father has lavished on us? Behold what manner of love. God doesn't just say He loves us. He has lavished on us. He has expressed it to us by allowing us and adopting us as sons and daughters of His. His love is expressive. And may I add this? I added this to my notes this morning. And eternal. A lot of people grow up wondering, does my daddy love me? And even psychologically, not to become a pop psychologist here, but even psychologically, a lot of people have issues in their lives because deep down they're still trying to get the approval of the Father who never said, I love you, who never said, I'm proud of you. And deep down they just can't accept themselves and nothing they do is good enough. And it brings all sorts of issues and problems. God's love is not that way. God's love is eternal. He never stops loving you. And it is expressed. John 3.16 For God so loved the world He gave. Romans 5.8 God commended. That means He demonstrated His love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so for God, love is a verb. It's not a noun. It is a verb. It is action. For God, love sends. Love woos. Love pursues us. Love heals. Love corrects. Love comforts. Love teaches us. Love sacrifices. Love bleeds. Love dies. It's an action. It's expressed. It's like the Psalms, the old hymn says, I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary says. I love you. I love you. I love you. Written in red. When God says He loves you, it's not just empty words. It is expressed. His love is expressed in us being able to be His children. It's expressed in what He did on Calvary 2,000 years ago. You notice in your Bible, oftentimes when it speaks about the love of God, it's past tense. See how He loved us. Now that's not because God doesn't love you today, but it's pointing back to the cross. The cross is God's expression of His love to us. But it doesn't end there. He loves us and expressed in the fact that He sent the Holy Spirit to bring us to Himself when we wanted nothing to do with God. When we, like sheep, had all gone astray. He's the one that runs after us. God's love is expressed that when we got sense enough to say, Lord, forgive me, come into my heart and life, He gloriously saves us, forgives us, cleanses us, redeems us, adopts us, changes us. All of this is expressions of God's love. And then from there on out, as we walk with God, He corrects us, He guides us, He encourages us. When we start getting wayward again, He brings us back in a thousand and one ways. He expresses His love toward us. You never need doubt. Does your Heavenly Father love you? For you can always point back to the cross. And you can always look in your own life at all the things God has done. Because simply... He loves you. Do you realize he didn't have to do any of this stuff I just said? He was under obligation to do, he wasn't any, any obligation to do any of it. He did it simply because he loves us. God's love is expressed. Let me apply this to fathers. Fathers, our love needs to be expressed as well. Not enough all my kids know they love me. You need to express it. First of all, in words. How many times in the Bible does, does God remind us of His love for us? We need to express our love for our children. We need to say the words, I love you. It's not hard to say. By the way, say it to your wife once in a while too. I love you. As a matter of fact, 
Let's just practice it, man. All of you together. I love you. See, that wasn't that hard. Why do we find it so hard to say that to someone's face that we do love? I know you love your kids. Tell them you love them. Tell them you're proud of them. Now, don't do it in a false sort of way. I mean, if your kid's messed up really bad, that needs to handle. But when you're able to, tell them, I'm proud of you and I love you. It goes so long. Even if your kids act like they could care less whether you said or not, they remember. They remember. We need to express our love. We need to show our love. We need to say it, and then we need to show it. Hugs are good, too. Real men hug. Give your child a hug. Spend time with them, not just around them. There's a big difference there. You can be around somebody and not be with them. Spend time with them. Engage yourself with them. Talk to them. Do some things they like to do. Wonderful idea when your kids are younger is to have a day out with them. If it's a daughter, call it a, a daddy and daughter date. If it's a son, just call it an outing with your boy. <coughs> All these things are ways we express our love. Just like God expresses His love to us, we as fathers need to express our love to our children. Good preaching. Amen. God sets boundaries too. He expresses His love, and as our Heavenly Father, <coughs> excuse me, He sets boundaries. Sets boundaries around our life. Guardrails, if you will. Fences. Say the boundary that he set. What is it? That's his moral laws. Leviticus 18.5 Keep my decrees and laws for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. I don't know if you've ever been like me. Sometimes when I'm driving, I get a little distracted, maybe with the radio, or maybe I'm trying to eat a hamburger or something, not to catch up on me. And so you look down for a minute, and your car begins to drift a little bit. I know you won't want to be around me now when I'm driving. <laughs> but come on, everybody's done this. And your car begins to drift a little bit. And as you get toward the edge of the road, and now they even have in the center of the road, which is a great idea too, you hit what's called rumble strips. I looked that up because I didn't know what they were called. You know, those little grooves they put in the road that when you're tired, it just makes that sound. It lets you know, hey, you're drifting. Dummy, pay attention. Wake up. Don't worry about the ketchup. And of course, when you hear that, you make the correction. Well, that's what God's law is, is moral law. They're like those rumble strips on the life of our road because we get distracted, don't we? With, with other things, the sin that so easily besets us, the things that weigh us down, as Hebrews 1 or 11, 1, or 12, 1, excuse me, tells us. And, and we can get, get our eyes off Jesus and begin to drift into danger. And so God puts these rumble strips and He uses the Holy Spirit to wake us up with them. Say, wait a minute, this is wrong. This isn't right. You better make the correction. <coughs> I mean, think about it. Why does God tell us not to steal? Why does He tell us not to covet? Why does God tell us to have not to have other things ahead of Him? Why does He care about whether we're sexually pure or not? Why does God tell us not to harbor lust in our heart or hatred in our heart and that we need to forgive? Why does He put these rumble strips on the highway of our life? Is God just trying to make life hard? Is He just up there saying, well, uh, let's set up some rules for them and make life miserable for them until they get to heaven? Is He trying to make it difficult for us? No, these things protect our life. From the things that destroy us, they protect our souls. Because understand what God says, thou shalt not. 
It is because he knows if we do that, it is going to be bring nothing but pain and destruction in our life and in the life of others. And those of you who have gotten off into these types of things, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You would love to be able to turn the clock back and say, I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd never fell into that sin. I wish I'd never been gunned down this path. And so God puts these things around us to protect us from the hurt and the harm. And thank God if we're foolish enough to continue on, once we wake up and we repent and confess, He forgives, He cleanses, He brings healing. Thank God for all that. But isn't it better never to go there to begin with? And so that's why He puts these things around us. To protect our life, protect our soul. So when God says hands off, eyes off, ears off, don't listen to that, don't watch that, stay out of there, don't do that, walk this way, not walk that way. He's not trying to ruin your life. He's trying to protect you from that which destroys and damns. And He's trying to give you life, not ruin your life. You know, we all heard, I'm sure, the tragic story of the child in Florida that was dragged in a lagoon now where he drowned by an alligator. Horrible, horrible event. And one of the things that came out in the investigation of all that, and I believe this still to be true, there was no sign saying that there were any alligators in that lagoon. Not one sign. Now there was a do not swim sign, but that could mean anything. You know, that could simply mean no lifeguard on duty, don't, so don't swim. Or the water's kind of like St. Mary's Lake, don't, don't get in there. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, if I was staying at that nice of a hotel, and they had a beachfront, it would not even occur to me there would be an alligator around. I would have thought, well, they probably weed those things out, and they're not anywhere around. There was no warning sign, and look what happened. Well, God puts all kinds of warning signs in His Word about what we should do, what we should avoid, and He does it because He loves us. And He wants to protect us from going into those things where we can be dragged off, so to speak, harmed and hurt. Tears of regret, pain and sorrow. That's what the seeds of sin sow in our life. The wages of sin will always be death. And God wants to protect you from that. So as our loving Father, He sets boundaries. And He said, now that you're my child, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And when you begin to go away and you begin to do this, that, that, you're going to have some rumble strips. You're going to feel some conviction. You're going to get some preacher nosing into your business. You're going to hear something. And I'm going to warn you. And if you ignore that, I'll correct you. And if you ignore, ignore that, then I'm going to punish you. Not, not because I hate you, but because I love you. And I don't want you to get off into something that's going to destroy you and damn your soul eventually if you continue on that path. He sets boundaries. And fathers, applying this to us, we love our children. They need boundaries. They need correction. They need direction. They need to know what is right and what is wrong. And I preached quite extensively on that last year. I'm sure you remember every detail. But I'll just mention it here. As fathers, we need to set boundaries in our families. What's acceptable? What's not? Don't let just any old thing come through the television screen. And the internet has become such, so accessible, I'll put it this way, so accessible to children, we really have to control it as much as we can. Because all of us here know, if you're on the internet at all, that you can get anything at the click of a button. Anything. There's no filtering at all. And our children are very tech savvy, much more so than we are. And it used to be 10, 15 years ago, they would tell you, well, make sure the family computer is somewhere 
where everyone can be in a traffic area of your home. And that's the way you protect your children from getting on things they shouldn't. Or getting on chat rooms and talking with people they shouldn't. Giving out information they shouldn't. But now with smartphones, what do you do now? It's hard, isn't it? Because kids have smartphones. They have internet access. They can be anywhere and access anything. But there's different things you can do to set boundaries. And I'll let you and the Lord talk about the specifics. There's software you can buy. There's ways of checking up on where they've been, who they're talking to, what they're looking at. And you need to let them know you're doing that. There's different boundaries you can set. For me, there would be a certain age limit where they wouldn't have a smartphone. Why does an eight-year-old need a smartphone? But that's between you and your family. That's a decision for you to make. All I'm saying is you need to set boundaries. Boundaries about that. Boundaries about what takes up your time in the family. <coughs> I was thinking about this this week. When I was growing up, sound like an old man here. When I was growing up. You know, we had some children's activities. And uh, I, I played Little League Baseball. Took up two nights a week during uh, about two months of the summer. And so we had some of that. But today, I mean literally, your child could be busy Sunday through Sunday. All summer long. All, I mean there's just so many things for your kid to be involved in. And most of them are very good things, and there's nothing wrong in and of itself. But once again, as a father, boundaries need to be set because you need to make sure they don't get over-involved, especially to the point that it begins to draw them away from the things of God. You need to be careful about that. I knew a, a child one time uh, in another church in uh, Lipsick. Uh, got saved during the Bible school. I mean, really saved, 11 years old. Excited about God. Excited about the things of God. He played baseball. was a good baseball player. At 11 years of age, his parents signed him up for a, some traveling league team, as well as his local teams, and so on and so forth. And that summer, immediately following the Bible school, this kid played 70 games. 11 years old, traveling all over Michigan, here, there, wherever, playing in these tournaments, playing in these games. Consequently, never in church. Never on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, not there. Just all involved in this. What do you think happened to the passion that child had for the Lord. It wasn't cultivated. Now, is there anything wrong playing baseball or soccer? No. But as fathers, especially Christian fathers, we need to set those boundaries to protect our family so that kids don't get overloaded with everything that they can get involved in. That's another boundary I believe fathers need to set. And on and on we could go. God sets boundaries for us out of His love for us. We as Christian fathers need to set boundaries for our children. Let me give you one more here very quickly. Provision. God out of His love for us provides. And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. I love Jesus just puts it so simply. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He provides for us. And just uh, and in so many different ways. I could tell you story after story, but let me tell you just a quick one. One time, Gretchen was in charge of Bible school in Bradford. And we got to the Friday night, which was kind of a big ending to Bible school. All kinds of games outside and stuff going on. She woke up that morning as sick as a dog. I mean, Gretchen's not one to complain about not feeling well. So when she tells you, I don't feel well, you know she doesn't feel well. Especially when she says, I can't go to church. You know she doesn't feel well. Especially when she's in charge of what's happening. 
I mean, she just couldn't hardly lift her head off the pillow. I don't have a clue what in the world was wrong with her. But she looked at me later in that afternoon and said, I just can't go. And of course, I smiled and patted her on the hand. You just stay here and rest. But inside, I'm panicking. Because she's in charge of this. I mean, I was helping, but I didn't know all the detail. And she's trying to explain to me what needs to be done. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll handle it. But I'm panicking. And I drive to the church, and we're doing our best to set things up. I'm trying to remember everything she says. And it's about 15 minutes before we start. And I look up, and there's Gretchen. I'm like, what are you doing here? And she says, I prayed, and I feel better. And that's literally what she did. She just prayed and said, God, you know, I need to be there. Help me, Lord, to feel better. And she said, I began to feel better. And then I got up. And the more I moved, the better I felt. She called her sister. Because at the time, we only had one car. And her sister came and took her to Bradford. And there she was. And by the end of the night, it was like she was never sick. Now, that's just a little simple way of how our Heavenly Father provided what we needed. And on and on. Financially, I could tell you stories about that. Physically, so on and so forth. But what we need, God provides materially and spiritually. And fathers, we need to do the same. God calls for us to provide for our families. And most of us do a pretty decent job materially. But what about spiritually? Are you the spiritual head of your household? Are you the one your children see pray? Are you the one that reads the Bible to them, talks to them about the things of God? Thank God for godly mothers that do that. But fathers, are you the one that takes the initiative and bring your children to church? Or are you just kind of dragged along? Your children need you to provide for them spiritually as well. And let me just end by, by saying this. The Christian faith is much more likely to be passed on to the next generation when the Father provides for the spiritual needs of the family. In other words, it's the Father that leads the family spiritually. The Christian faith is much more apt to be passed on. Well, let's wrap this up here. Fathers, you're important. And we have a Father in Heaven who's perfect. And we can lean on Him for help so that we can fulfill the role of Father the way He's calling us to do and be. And for all of you, your Father in Heaven loves you. I just want that to be your thought. He loves you. And His love is expressed. His love sets boundaries and His love provides what you need. So I encourage you to lean on your father's love today. So when you think about